Well, the book's not just about the life of the mind because you, you get into it, into her writings, and you discover what your mother had to say about sex for the first time <laughs> when she thinks about killing herself, when she mourns her marriage as a failure. She's very revelatory. Yes. I mean, some of that was written down and some of it she just said to me. I mean, we were quite close, uh, as mothers and daughters, I suppose, often are. She often spoke to me about the emotional aspect of her life, although she tended not to write that down in the memoirs. You write at the start of the book that your mother wasn't the sort of person people usually write biographies about. Elaborate. <laughs> well, look, one of the things that got me going with this book was that I just read a run of biographies about... I won't mention any of their names, but I thought... Many of them were the wives or daughters of men who had made a lot of money um, by various kinds of business dealings or done things that were not particularly admirable in my mind and certainly their daughters or their wives. You know, big deal. They inherited a lot of money and they did various interesting things because they had the the money, the education and the freedom to do it. But um, why write biographies of them when out there are countless... Uh, unsung, you know, mute, inglorious Miltons. I'm glad you raised that because before we started talking, you were telling me that once your mum wrote me a letter. Yes. And to which I replied. But that reminds me of the fact that down in the National Library, there are hundreds of boxes of correspondence. And I kept up lifetime correspondence uh -huh. with people that wrote to me. Yes. And the thing that astonished me was, A, the quality of the letters and, B, the amount of undiscovered talent oh, out there. In those letters, yes. I've given this thought to my mother in the book, although she never said it, but I'm sure she would have agreed with me. Um, most of our experiences in life, we can go to art and find that someone has been there before us. So if you want to kill yourself, you can find, for example, the Keats poem in which Keats says, now more than ever seems it rich to die. So there's a kind of reflection of your individual experience in, in art. Now, there are several worlds which that isn't so of, and one of them is being a parent, particularly being a mother, for the good reason, of course, that most women in the past did not were not able to become both mothers and writers and leave a record. So that means all those parts of our experience have no reflection, there's no mirror that we can turn to, and I think the lives of ordinary people is another of them. You know, you raise a point that reading is often a process of validation. One has an idea, one has a thought, and then five, ten years later you find that Bertrand Russell yes. had the same one. And you yes. feel, suddenly you feel that you've got company. Yes. But for many parts of life, dealing with death, I think has mm -hmm. always been one, there's no ready scripts available. Yeah. And so someone like your mum's got to think it all up. Yes, that's right. But then, if you can, leave it behind so somebody else can have the benefit that you didn't have yeah. of someone having recorded it in some way or another. One of the things that's likeable about your mum is the way she embraced or was open to the people she met when she gets to the city, the bohemian socialist suffragettes, a gay bloke or two, mm -hmm. people who might not have been welcome back home. Yes. You know, she grew up in such a narrow, that narrow rural working class and yet somehow she transcended that. The other remarkable thing about her is that she had no, none of the prejudices of her age. I never heard her say anything racist or anti-Semitic, and yet those two things they're were a part of, They're a part of the life in the bush. They still are. They often. still are, and certainly back, back then, when mm. political correctness were not two words you ever put together. Well, how did that happen, Kate, do you imagine? Look, I think, How did she uh, escape the gravitational pull of bigotry, for example? I have a feeling her connection with literature might have been... Because that did start very early. I still have her copy of Keats that she won for coming second in the intermediate at Tamworth High. That went very deep with her. Um, it told her that there was a much bigger world than the, yeah. than the world she knew. And that was enough to be going on with until she met that world and she was then ready to meet it with kind of an open heart. So the gravitational pull of literature overcame, to a large extent, the gravitational pull of living in... Of her own in, culture. Yeah. yeah. Look, that's my guess. Yeah. You know, in some ways she was absolutely typical of women of her generation, but in other ways she was remarkable. 
typical of women of a generation. I'd like to think that was true, although in a way it would make you even sadder for <laughs> so many women who were so frustrated, so feeling such claustrophobia culturally, yes. sexually, in yes, every way. Yes, in every way. Because for women, I mean, for mum, the great, the great escape was, first of all, that her parents really turned their back on her so she was free, and in a way that freed her. And the other great thing was that she had a means of making money because she was a registered pharmacist. And you can always get a job if you're a registered pharmacist. That gave her the freedom, I think, to think freely, which most women did not have. They were locked into a man and marriage and whatever they were doomed to. Tell us about her life's end. Look, she had a good end. I mean, it, all lives have to end. She often said to me, I never want to be 90. By then she was living in an old, a very, very good old person's home. When she decided that she'd got too old and frail to live at home, she didn't want to live with any of us because she didn't want to be a burden. See what a generous woman she was. She timed it so brilliantly. She was a month short of her 90th birthday when she had a heart attack, followed a week later by another. And uh, she had often said to me, look, I'm ready to go. And she also said a most wonderful thing. In fact, she wrote it down for us all. She said, mourn me, but not too much. I've had a wonderful life. Isn't that a good... That's oh, the, last, the last wonderful gift. I mean, gift. heaven's above. <laughs> what an epitaph that is, isn't yeah. it? Mourn me, <laughs> but, but not, not too, too much. much. Anyway, thank you. Kate Grenville's new book, One Life, a biography of her mum, is out now from Text Publishing. Good on your text.